So what we're going to do today, besides <laughs> me thanking each and every one of you for coming out today, for honoring CSU veterans as well as veterans all over the <coughs> world, I do appreciate you taking a moment out of your time, out of your schedule, just to be a part of this celebration, because it does make each one of us who have served feel even much more grateful that we did. So I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we did something a little different this year. Um, <laughs> and it really helps that I'm fairly new here. But um, we did a memorial table. And Kiana Bias is actually going to come and talk to us and tell us a little bit about the memorial table. And then from that point, we're going to take a moment of silence. So Ms. Bias. Good morning, everybody. I just want to say I just want to thank you all for being here as well. Those who have served and those currently serving in the uniformed services of the United States are ever mindful that the sweetness of enduring peace has always been tainted by the bitterness of personal sacrifice. We are compelled to never forget that while we enjoy our daily pleasures, there are others who have endured and may still be enduring the agonies of pain, deprivation, and imprisonment. We call your attention to this small table, which occupies the place of dignity and honor. It is set for one, symbolizing the fact that members of our armed forces are missing from our ranks. They are referred to as POWs and MIAs. We call them comrades. They are unable to be with their loved ones and families, so we join together to pay humble tribute to them and to bear witness to their continued absence. The table is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his or her suppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of the purity to their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single rose in the vase signifies the blood they may have shed. The rose also reminds us of the family and friends of our missing comrades who keep faith while awaiting their return. The red ribbon on the vase represents the red ribbons worn on the lapels of thousands who demand the unyielding determination and proper account of our comrades who are not among us. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt sprinkled on the plate reminds us of the countless volunteers of their families as they the glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us at this time. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope, which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home, away from captors to open arms of a grateful nation. The American flag reminds us that many of them may never return, and that they have paid the supreme sacrifice to ensure our freedom. Let us remember and never forget their sacrifice. May God forever watch over them and their families. At this time, we will now have a brief moment of silence to honor our prisoner of war, missing in action, and fallen veterans. Thank you. Thank you. And that's the part where they say never forget, because you never forget the ones who have sacrificed their life for this country, and that's for each and every one of us. Our next speaker is someone who is very personable, someone who is kind and friendly, and any student can walk up to her and you would not know that she was the president of Cleveland State University. So I have the honor and the privilege of 
welcoming to the podium our uh, CSU 8th president, President Laura Bloomberg. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to see you here today. It's a very special uh, day of commemoration for me. Veterans Day has always meant so much to me personally. I am not a veteran. I come from a family of veterans. And the, the time we take to pause and to remember, I believe, is central to who we are as a people and who we are as a democracy. I want to thank Terry Walker, the Veteran and Military Student Success Center, for all the work they put into planning today. Um, all of the events of this week and all of the ways that they support our veterans. And I, I want to talk a little bit about the, the essential role that I think veterans fill on our campus. But first I want to say something personal about this. Um, in the late 1980s, my brother and sister-in-law, Brian and Karen, both enlisted, were enlisted, they were career um, army uh, they, were, they, were, they were enlisted in the Army and they made it their career. But in the early 80s, they fell in love, got engaged, and in the late 80s, they uh, not only declared their intent to get married, but their intent to start a family. And those of you who are veterans or enlisted will know what they had to do next. They had to complete a, uh, quite a lot of paperwork um, and identify a next of kin who would raise their children in the event that they were deployed or or God forbid, lost their lives. And they turned to my husband and I and asked us to do that. And I said, sure, no problem, we can do that. They weren't even pregnant yet. Um, and then Alex was born and we entered the first desert storm, the Iraq war in the early 90s. And we became um, de facto parents, guardians to this little boy when both my brother and sister-in-law were deployed. Um, and every day we prayed for their safety. It broke my heart when Alex learned to walk, um, and we were there um, when he learned to walk, not his mom and dad. And when he learned to speak, he wanted to call us mom and dad or mommy and daddy, and we were adamant that we were not gonna let that happen. I couldn't do that to my brother and my sister-in-law. We were auntie and uncle. Um, the potty training, I would have been happily uh, glad to let their parents do that. That would have been our third bout with potty training. We had two kids of our own. Um, but he was ours, and we raised him as ours until they came back home, thank God, safely. Um, now fast forward to this December. This will be the first commencement I will miss, I think, in my entire career in higher education because little Alex is getting married. And um, we will join his parents in, in walking him down the aisle because he was uh, so central to our lives. And I don't think it was my sacrifice, but I think about the sacrifice of his mom and dad who love him deeply, who had to let go of that and let us be the ones to help him learn to walk and be potty trained and learn all the things that toddlers learn while they were serving our country. And I think that that has been very formative for me in, in understanding why it's so important for every one of us to stop and remember the sacrifices and the dedication of our enlisted men and women. So now let me speak to you um, as a university president who believes deeply in the role of diversity on a college campus to create an enriched learning environment. And I'm talking about all kinds of diversity. Um, racial and gender and age and political orientation and religious affiliation diversity and I am thinking about our enlisted men and women and our veterans who have experienced life in a way that many of us will never fully understand and I have enormous gratitude enormous gratitude for the enlisted men and women who are students or the veterans who are students who have the courage and the wherewithal to share a perspective in classroom discussions on campus to help us all understand. And I think it has to be hard. I talked to Alex, my nephew, about this a lot, who's also now um, enlisted in the Army. Uh, and he will say things like, he calls me Auntie Lori. Auntie Lori, you just don't get it. And I said, I got all day. Alex, try. Help me understand. And when he does, I am better for it. 
So I'm grateful to Alex and I'm grateful to all of our enlisted students, our military students who do that for our campus. Now I gotta look at my notes because I gotta get these data right. Um, Cause it's important. Ohio is among the top 10 states with the most veterans. And this is something I didn't know before. Cuyahoga County has the most veterans in our state. So we're a top 10 state. Cuyahoga County has the most veterans, nearly 10% of our population or 80,000 residents are veterans. That's a lot of people for whom we should be showing our gratitude in our neighborhoods, in our communities this week, but, but really always. It is our duty as a university then to also create an environment that is welcoming and respectful to our enlisted men and women, to their family members, and to our, our military veterans. And I hope every day to live up to that expectation and that aspiration I have for this campus community. To our guest speakers today, I wanna thank you for reminding us what it means to make the sacrifice of service and to all of you for being here. Thanks for making the time to stop and remember. Thank you. And thank you for the caring heart. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you. And now we have three speakers. And as you see, one chair is empty. However, I am still going to give the information about that. When deciding about this particular program, I asked the students at the center, what would they like to see? And uh, it was a suggestion from one of them who said, why don't you have an active duty person, a dependent, and a veteran. I actually thought that was a great idea. So that's actually what I did. So the active duty person, and I, I will talk about them in order of the way they're going to speak, what is Christopher White. He is a Sergeant First Class um, in the Ohio Army National Guard. He has been in the um, National Guard for 15 years. and. He stated that he got into it because, and that's him who I'm talking about, just walk through the door. Look at God. <laughs> he said it. Um, he's decided that he had joined for the educational benefits as well as the ability to be able to serve his country. He has been a recruiter for three years in the Cleveland area, which he serves uh, as a campus and ROTC recruiter for Cleveland State University, John Carroll University, Notre Dame College, Case Western Reserve University, and Tri-C East and Metro Campus, Cuyahoga Community College. Then we will have our dependent speaker, Jahara Muhammad. She is a dependent of an Army veteran. Her father, Kevin Jamal Muhammad, served in four years in the Army, and he, he received an honorable discharge. He was a specialist, which is an E-4, when he got out, and he served in combat, combat during Operation Desert Storm. Our veteran is a Cleveland State-owned, Michael Artbauer. He is a retired major from the Marine Corps. He served from 1986 to 2006. He was a CH-53 AD Sea Stallion helicopter pilot a KC-130FR, and we're going to find out what those are, right? <laughs> Hercules pilot, and Air Officer 2nd Battalion, 7th Marine. He also served on Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Kosovo Air Campaign, which is Operation Novo Anvil, Anvil, Somalia and Kenya, Operation Restore Hope, and Bosnia and Herzegovina, Govina, Operation Joint Guard. Those are our three speakers. Um, I know you will not be sorry that you hear from them because I know that they will give you food for thought of what the military and service has done for them. Mr. White, you're up. <laughs> How you doing? My name is Sergeant First Class Christopher White. 
Um, I've been in the military 15 years. Um, I've served on a, a few different assignments um, to include I was an instructor, I've uh, been an acting platoon sergeant, um, and, and uh, been to a few places, uh, Afghanistan twice, um, Iraq for like two months, I've been to Kuwait, uh, Turkey, Poland, uh, you name it. Um, I have three children, two of which live in Florida, the other one lives in LA, so I'm on a flight pretty much every other month. Um, I've been a recruiter for almost three years now. I uh, came from being an instructor for uh, 88 Mike, which is um, a motor transport operator. It's just a truck driver, nothing, nothing fancy. Um, I'm also an Army plumber. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a month-long course, uh, nothing, nothing too crazy. Um, the only value in that is I don't have to call a plumber in my house. <laughs> um, I'm sure if any of y'all know, just to get them out there, it's $150. Um, too much else. Uh, I love I love serving in the military. I got another 10 years to go. Um, I know I said 15, but National Guard, um, everything every day is inactive unless you're active. So I still have another 10 years to go. Um, I'm only 37. Uh, I know I may look 21, but I'm. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's all I got. Um, I thank I thank everyone for having me here today. Uh, it was in the script for me to make a grand entrance. <laughs> okay? Uh, so. Service. Huh? Okay. Um, so uh, let's just, I guess, talk about what I did in Afghanistan. So uh, I was a truck driver in Afghanistan um, for a long time. You know, you're talking 15, 16 hour convoys, and, and that's just a, just a series of trucks going from. The, the north part of Afghanistan to the south part. Um, just troop transport, and taking supplies and everything. Um, contrary to popular, like everything you see on the, on the movies is actually not real. Um, uh, other than that, um, that's, that's all I got. That's good? Okay, thank you. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Jahara Muhammad. Today, I stand before you to share a brief glimpse into my life as a dependent as a, of a veteran and the profound impact that my father's service had on our family. As a child of a veteran, I have experienced both the challenges and blessings that come with this unique perspective. My father, like countless others, answered all the call, call of duty, sacrificing his time, his energy, and sometimes his safety for our family to protect the freedom and the values we hold dearly. His commitment serving to our country is not only commendable and also deeply personal for our family. The, de the dedication and courage to display during his time in the military continue to inspire me and me every day. However, being a dependent of a veteran also comes with its set of challenges, which could include constant relocations, separations, and emotional tolls to our family. Yet, I also experienced the strength and resilience that the military families possess. We learn to adapt and support one another and cherish the moments we had together. Our family, like many others, benefited from the support system and resources available to veterans. These programs may play a crucial role in ensuring that veterans and their families receive assistance and recognition, and they serve for their sacrifices. As a dependent of a veteran, I have come to appreciate the importance of honoring and supporting our veterans and their families. It's not just about acknowledging their service on Veterans Day or Memorial Day. It's about recognizing their sacrifices extend beyond from their active duty and the deserve gratitude and respect assistance through their lives. So I will commend you today and every other day to say thank you to our veterans and their families. Say it every day or whenever you, whenever you think of them. In conclusion, my experience as a dependent has shaped me into who I am today. I will forever be proud of my dad 
and his experiences and his sacrifices, let us always remember and honor the veterans, not only in the words, but in action, and ensuring their dependent service or care and support they deserve. And thank you, I'm Jahara. pilot eyes are not the pilot eyes of my youth. So, <laughs> Good morning, uh, I am Michael Arfauer, and I am the Chief of Staff to the Provost here at Cleveland State, but more importantly today, I'm standing here at this podium as a Marine. Yes, I am retired from active duty, but I am forever and always a proud Marine. Today as we celebrate here at CSU in advance of Saturday's official Veterans Day, I want to know or discuss how this holiday that we know as Veteran Day, Veterans Day came into existence. In the early 20th century, during the years of 1914 to 1918, a devastating war was fought on the European continent, war that the United States was inevitably drawn into in 1917. This war would ultimately become known as World War I, and it was thought at the time that it would be the war to end all wars. Sadly, we know that this was not the case. The hostilities of World War I were formally ended on the 11th hour of the 11th month of the 11th day of 1918. In other words, November 11th at 11 a.m., 1918. When the armistice that was forced upon Germany, and I use that term for a reason, um, went into effect and the guns finally fell silent. While Americans fought in this conflict, we did not enter until 1917, and the brunt of the war fell upon England and France, and I'm not going to minimize also Germany and Russia. Um, so Remembrance Day was first held um, in, on November 11th, 1919, in the United Kingdom, the, greater, uh, the Commonwealth. Um, so it's a Memorial Day first observed by them. Um, and it's typically a moment of silence at, on November 11th at 11 a.m. And this is done nat nationally. So Remembrance Day preceded our Armistice Day. The United States Congress adopted a resolution on June 4th, 1926, requesting that President Calvin Coolidge issue an annual proclamation calling for the observance of the armistice every November 11th with appropriate ceremonies. A congressional act approved in May 1938 made November 11th a legal holiday, a day to be dedicated to the cause of world peace and be thereafter celebrated and known as Armistice Day. At the urging of major U.S. veterans organization, Armistice Day was renamed Veterans Day in 1954. Amongst non-veterans and, and really even among veterans, there is some confusion on what this day means and how do we celebrate it. Simply put, Veterans Day is the happy day where we now celebrate those who have served and who are currently serving. This is opposed to the more somber celebration that is in Memorial Day in May, whose purpose is to honor those who that served and paid the ultimate price. There is, of course, also the Marine Corps birthday ball, or birthday, which is Friday, November 10th, and that's a whole different celebration. <laughs> God help us, it falls on Friday this year, too. So. Um, this morning, I sadly note that while World War I was thought, as I mentioned earlier, to be the war to end all wars, and it clearly did not, I spent 20 years on active duty as a commission officer in the all-volunteer force. I entered service in 1986 during the waning years of what is uh, known as the Cold War. But also over, it was only, um, I started just 10 years after the end of the Vietnam conflict of the U.S. involvement. The Cold War rose from the ashes of World War II and was a proximal cause of both the Korean War and the war in Vietnam. In the late 1980s and early 90s, I served through the period of the redefining of the usage of the American military forces after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of the term the peace dividend that saw U.S. forces deployed in places like Bosnia and Somalia, ostensibly for good. I also found myself recalled from a special aviation school where I had been sent for training in August of 1990 in order to join my helicopter squadron in deploying to Saudi Arabia 
as part of the initial forces committed to defense of Saudi Arabia and to deter the forces of Saddam Hussein in what ultimately became known as Desert Shield, Desert Storm. We know how well that worked out over the last 20 plus years of conflict in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. And today we watch with the great trepidation of the events occurring over in Israel and in the Gaza Strip. I pray that there can be a peaceful and meaningful solution to the problems and we veterans can grow older and watch our ranks diminish in numbers rather than continue to grow due to conflict. To all veterans, I wish you a happy, happy Veterans Day Saturday. Be proud in your service and revel in your memories. Thank you to each one of you for um, sharing your words of inspiration and your words of service. The theme for the United States Veterans Day for this year is service. And that's exactly what you do in the military, you serve. So now we're going to have Tyranny Campbell play God Bless America. Thank you very much for that, um, Ms. Campbell. I really appreciate it. Now, next on our program, every year, um, Neopat, Northeast Ohio um, a Patriotism Organization, asks for a student of the year. And we also honor that same student of the year. So this year, we had staff and faculty in the nominations and then with the nominations we had a committee go through the process to award or pick our student of the year so this year's student of the year is William T. Oz Olmstead so um, Mr. Olmstead if you would come forward on behalf of the um, CSU Veterans and Military Student Success Center, we want to say congratulations on being this year's 2023 Student of the Year. Thank you so much, Terry. You're welcome. <laughs> Here's the box you want to put that back in, too. But I'm going to give you the mic to say a few words. Good morning, everyone. I'll begin by extending my eternal gratitude to the individuals that are responsible for this award. Uh, President Bloomberg, Professor Jerome Collier, Dean Carolyn Broering Jacobs, Dean Sarah Beznaska, Dean Barbara Andelman, Dean Lee Fisher, Professor Brian Ray, and all the incredible faculty and staff at the College of Law. Also to Terry Walker and the entire team at the Veterans and Military Student Success Center for the incredible work you do to support our veterans and our ROTC cadets on campus and across this great city. Next, to all the veterans, service members, and cadets that are here today, thank you for your honorable service. And finally, to the men of C Company, 1st Battalion, 148th Infantry Regiment, who I had the privilege of commanding in Baghdad, Iraq, in 2022 and 2023. Your sacrifices will never be discarded. 
Two of the most consequential decisions I made in my life were the decision to join the United States Army and the decision to enroll in the College of Law here at Cleveland State University. The profound impact of both institutions has changed me inexorably for the better. And I know that many of our student veterans feel the same across the many diverse undergraduate and graduate colleges here at the university and the branches of the armed forces. It is derivative for me to identify that this country is the victim of ever increasing political and ideological polarization and contentiousness. However, I take great solace in the firsthand knowledge that our most trusted and apolitical institution, the armed forces, still serves as a bastion of multiplicity, tolerance, professionalism, and commitment to the unending values of our democratic republic. The military is a place where Americans of diverse race, ethnicity, ethos, political party, gender identity, sexual preference, religious, religious affiliation, and economic background come together in the truest expression of what our nation can accomplish when unified, impassioned, and empowered. With heartfelt gratitude, thank you for this award, and thank, for, thank you for all your commitment to the success of our veterans and our students. God bless you all, and God bless the United States of America. I just really want to go out and say thank you to all of those who have done everything that they could possibly do to help make this a success, as well as constantly tell me it's going to be OK. So I appreciate that. Um, um, President Bloomberg, I appreciate your presence here. Um, Mr. Olmstead, Mr. Arbauer. Mohammed, Mr. White, Ms. Kitchen, Ms. Bias, um, Ms. Nags, I'm forgetting one person. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell, thank you. Um, for all of you guys, thank you for coming out. Um, and if I did not mention anyone by name, please charge it to my mind and not my heart, because this is uh, slips sometimes. So <laughs> I don't always remember, but I want to say thank you. <laughs>